The following comments by Dr. John Owen are on Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There is required to seeking God a previous sense of a wanting, lost condition in ourselves by a distance from God. No man designs to come to God, but it is for relief, satisfaction, and rest. It must be out of an apprehension that he is yet at such a distance from God as not to be capable of relief or rest from him, and that in this distance he is in a condition indigent and miserable. It is also that there is relief and rest for him in God. Without these apprehensions, no man will ever engage in a design to come to God, as having no reason for it nor end in it. And this can be wrought in none sincerely but by faith. All other powers and faculties in the souls of men without faith do incline and direct them to look for rest and satisfaction in themselves. This is the highest notion of those philosophers who raise human wisdom into an admiration, namely the Stoics that everyone was to seek for all rest and satisfaction in himself and in nothing else. And so they came at length expressly to make every man a god to himself. Faith alone is the gracious power which takes us off from all confidence in ourselves and directs us to look for all in another, that is, in God himself. And therefore it must see that in God which is suited to give relief in this condition, and this is contained in the object of it as here proposed, as we shall see. Secondly, there must before this also be some encouragement given to him that will come to God, and that from God himself. A discovery of our wants, indigence, and misery makes it necessary that we should do so, but it gives no encouragement so to do, for it is accompanied with a discovery of our unworthiness so to do, and be accepted in doing it. And his glorious excellencies, absolutely. Nor is that anywhere in the scriptures absolutely and in the first place proposed for our encouragement. This therefore can be nothing but his free, gracious promise to receive them that come to him in a due manner. That is by Christ, as the whole scripture testifies. For what some pretend concerning coming to God by encouragements, taken from general notions of his nature, and his works of creation and providence without any promise, is an empty speculation, nor can they give any single instance of any one person that ever came to God and found acceptance with him without the encouragement of divine revelation which has in it the nature of a promise. Faith, therefore, is necessary to this coming to God because by this alone we receive, lay hold of, embrace the promises, and are made partakers of them, which the Apostle not only expressly affirms, but makes it his design to prove in a great part of the chapter, as we shall see. There is nothing, therefore, more fond, more foreign to the Apostle's intention, than what is here ignorantly and weakly by some pretended, namely, that faith here is nothing but an assent to the truth of the being of God, and his distribution of rewards and punishments, without any respect to the promise, that is, to Christ and his mediation, as will yet further appear. Therefore, to come to God is to have an access into his favor, to please God, as did Enoch. So to come is to be accepted with him. There may be a coming to God without our duties and services, as Cain did, when we are not accepted. But the apostle treats in this place only of an access with acceptance into his grace and favor as is manifest from his instance, his design and argument. For those that have this design, it is their duty to believe. This is the only way and means of attaining that end. Whence believing itself is often called coming to God or coming to Christ. Isaiah 55, 1 and verse 3, John 6, 37 and verse 44, John 7, 37. And it is by faith alone that we have an access into this grace, Romans 5, 2, that is, whereby we thus come to God, number 4. 
The object of this faith, or what in this case we ought to believe, is twofold. First, the being of God, believe that he is, and to his office, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The first thing to be believed is that God is. The expression seems to be imperfect, and something more is intended than the divine being absolutely, as his God. The schoolmen and a number of expositors on the place as Catherinus, Salmeron, Tina, and so on dispute earnestly how the being of God, which is the object of natural science, seeing it may be known by the light of reason, can be proposed as the object of faith, which respects only things unseen and evident supernatural, made known by revelation only. And many distinctions they apply to the solution of this difficulty. For my part, I... No way doubt, but the same thing, or a number may, on a number of respects, be the object of reason and faith also. So is it when that which is consistent with reason, and in general discoverable by it, is the creation of the world, is more distinctly and clearly proposed to faith by divine revelation, which does not destroy the former assent on principles of reason, but confirms a mind in the persuasion of the same truth by a new evidence given to it. But the Apostle speaks not here of any such assent to the truth of the being and existence of God as may be attained by reason or the light of nature, but that which is the pure object of faith, which the light of reason can no way reach to. For that he treats of such things only is evident from the description which he premises of the nature of faith, namely, that it is the evidence of things not seen. And it is such a believing of the being of God as gives encouragement to come to him, that we who are sinners may find favor and acceptance with him. And that apprehension which men may have of the being of God by the light of nature, yea, and of his being a rewarder, Cain had, as we have showed, and yet he had no share in that faith which the apostle here requires. Therefore it is evident from the context, the circumstances of the subject matter treated on, and the design of the apostle, that the being or existence of God proposed as the object of our faith, to be believed in the way of duty, is the divine nature with its glorious properties or perfections, as engaged in acting themselves in a way of giving rest, satisfaction, and blessedness to them that come to him. The second thing which, in order to the same end of acceptance with God, we are required to believe is that he is or will be a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That is, he will act in all things towards him suitably to the proposal which he makes of himself to faith, when he says, I am, and I am God Almighty, or the like. Two things may be considered in this object of faith. First, the assertion of the truth itself, God is a rewarder, Secondly, the limitation of the exercise of that property as to its object, unto them that diligently seek him. And this limitation wholly excludes the general notion of believing in rewards and punishments from God, present and future, from being here intended. For it is confined only to the goodness and bounty of God towards believers, those that seek him. His dealing with them is not exactly according to distributive justice with respect to themselves, but in a way of mercy, grace, and bounty. For the reward is of grace and not of works. That which these words of the Apostle have respect to, and which is the ground of the faith here required, is contained in the revelation that God made of himself to Abraham, Genesis 15, 1. Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. God is so a rewarder to them that seek him as that he himself is their reward, which eternally excludes all thoughts of merit in them that are so rewarded. Who can merit God to be his reward? Rewarding in God, especially where he himself is a reward, is an act of infinite grace and bounty, and this gives us full direction to the object of faith here intended, namely, God in Christ is revealed in the promise of him, given himself to believers as a reward to be their God, in a way of infinite goodness and bounty. The proposal of this is that alone which gives encouragement to come to him, which the apostle designs to declare. It is the most proper act of faith 
to come and cleave to God is a rewarder in the way of grace and bounty, as proposing himself for our reward. That faith is vain which does not put men on a diligent inquiry after God. The whole issue of our finding of God when we seek him depends on the way and rule which we take and use in our so doing. The following reading is from the collected works of John Owen on the Holy Spirit regarding sanctification. Believers themselves are oftentimes much unacquainted with it, either as to their apprehension of its true nature, causes and effects, or at least as to their own interest and concern in it. As we don't know of ourselves the things that are worked in us of the Spirit of God, so we seldom attend as we ought to his instructing of us in them. It may seem strange indeed that whereas all believers are sanctified and made holy, they should not understand or apprehend what is worked in them or for them, and what abides with them. But alas, how little do we know of ourselves, of what we are, and whence are our powers and faculties, even in things natural. By diligent consideration of these things, we may obtain a firm foundation to stand on, and a holy admiration of the infinite wisdom and goodness of that sovereign architect, who has raised this fabric to his own glory, and what we further attempt is vanity and curiosity. How little do we know of these souls of ours, and all that we do so is by their powers and operations which are consequential to their being. Now these things are our own naturally. They dwell and abide with us. They are we, and we are they, and nothing else. Yet it is no easy thing for us to have a reflex and intimate acquaintance with them. And is it strange if we should be much in the dark to this new nature, this new creature which comes from above, from God in heaven, in which our natural reason has no acquaintance? It is new, it is wonderful, it is a work supernatural, and is known only by supernatural revelation. We must also consider that holiness is not confined to this life, but passes over into eternity and glory. Death has no power over it to destroy it or divest us of it. For its acts indeed are transient, but its fruits abide forever in their reward. They who die in the Lord rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Revelation 14.13 God is not unrighteous to forget their labor of love. Hebrews 6.10 There is not any effect or fruit of holiness, not the least, not the giving of a cup of cold water to a disciple of Christ in the name of a disciple, but it shall be had in everlasting remembrance and abide forever in its eternal reward. Nothing shall be lost, but all the fragments of it shall be gathered up and kept safe forever. Everything else, how specious soever it be in this world, shall be burnt up and consumed, as hay and stubble, when the least, the meanest, the most secret fruit of holiness shall be gathered as gold and silver, durable substance into God's treasury, and become a part of the riches of the inheritance of the saints in glory. Let no soul fear the loss of any labor, in any of the duties of holiness, in a most secret contest against sin, for inward purity, for outward fruitfulness, and a mortification of sin, resistance of temptations, improvement of grace, and patience, moderation, self-denial, contentment, and all that you do know and what you do not know shall be revived, called over, and abide eternally in your reward. Our Father who now sees in secret will one day reward openly, and the more we abound in these things, the more will God be glorified in the recompense of reward. But this is not all, nor that which I intend. Secondly, it abides forever and passes over into glory in its principle or nature, the love in which we now adhere to God and by which we act the obedience of faith towards the saints does not fail. It doesn't end when glory comes on, but is a part of it. 1 Corinthians 13.8 It is true, some gifts shall be done away, is useless in a state of perfection and glory. As the apostle there discourses, and some graces shall cease as to some special acts and peculiar exercise, as faith and hope, so far as they respect things unseen and future. But all those graces in which holiness is constituted, and wherein it consists for the substance of them, as they contain the image of God, as by them we are united and adhere to God in Christ, 
shall in their present nature improve to perfection abide forever. In our knowledge of them, therefore, have we our principal insight into our eternal condition and glory. And this is, as a firm foundation of consolation, so a part of our chiefest joy in this world. Is it not a matter of unspeakable joy and refreshment that these poor bodies we carry about us, after they have been made a prey to death, dust, worms, and corruption, shall be raised and restored to life and immortality, freed from pain, sickness, weakness, weariness, invested with those qualities in conformity to Christ's glorious body, which yet we don't understand? It is so also that these souls which now animate and rule in us shall be delivered from all their darkness, ignorance, vanity, instability, and alienation from things spiritual and heavenly. But this is not all. These poor low graces which now live and are acting in us shall be continued, preserved, purified, and perfected, but in their nature be the same as now they are, as their souls and bodies shall be. That love in which we now adhere to God is our chiefest good, that faith in which we are united to Christ, our everlasting head, that delight in any of the ways or ordinances of God in which he is enjoyed, according as he has promised his presence in them, that love and good will which we have for all those in whom is the Spirit, and on whom is the image of Christ, with the entire principle of spiritual life and holiness, which is now begun in any of us, shall be all purified, enhanced, perfected, and passed into glory that very holiness which we here attain, those inclinations and dispositions, those frames of mind, those powers and abilities and obedience and adherence to God, which here contend with the weight of their own weakness and imperfection, and with the opposition that is continually made against them by the body of death, that is utterly to be abolished, shall be gloriously perfected into immutable habits, unchangeably acting our souls in the enjoyment of God, and this also manifests how much concern it is to us to be acquainted with the doctrine of it, and how much more to be really interested in it. Holiness is that which God indispensably requires of us. The full prosecution of this consideration we must put off to our arguments for the necessity of it, which will ensue in their proper place. At present I shall show that not only God requires holiness indispensably in all believers, but also that this is all which he requires of them or expects from them, for it comprises the whole duty of man, and this surely renders it needful for us both to know what it is and diligently to apply ourselves to the obtaining and assured participation of it. For what servant who has any sense of his relation and duty, if he be satisfied that his master requires but one thing of him, will not endeavor in acquaintance with it and a performance of it, some indeed say that their holiness, such as it is, is the chief or only design of the gospel, if they intend that it is the first principal design of God in and by the gospel, and that not only is to the perceptive part of it, but also as to its doctrinal and promissory parts, whence it is principally and emphatically denominated, it is a fond imagination. God's great and first design in and by the gospel is eternally to glorify himself, his wisdom, goodness, love, grace, righteousness, and holiness by Jesus Christ. And in order to this, his great and supreme end, he has designed the gospel and designs by the gospel to reveal that love and grace of his to lost sinners with the way of its communication through the mediation of his Son incarnate is the only means in which he will be glorified and in which they may be saved. Acts 26.18 To prevail with men in and by the dispensation of its truth and encouragement of its promises, to renounce their sins and all other expectations of relief or satisfaction, and to betake themselves by faith to that way of life and salvation which is therein declared to them, to be the means and instrument of conveying over to them and giving them a title to and a right in that grace and mercy, that life and righteousness which is revealed and tendered to them thereby, to be the way and means of communicating the Spirit of Christ with grace and strength to the elect, enabling them to believe and receive the atonement, by this to give them union with Christ as their spiritual and mystical head, is also to fix their hearts and souls in their choicest actings, in their faith, trust, confidence and love, immediately on the Son of God, as incarnate and their mediator. John 14, verse 1.
Chapter 2, Sanctification, a Progressive Work Sanctification described with the nature of the work of the Holy Spirit in it, which is progressive. The way and means whereby holiness is increased in believers, especially by faith and love, whose exercise is required in all duties of obedience, as also those graces whose exercise is occasional. Having passed through the consideration of the general concerns of the work of sanctification, I shall in the next place give a description of it, and then explain it more particularly in its principal parts. And this I shall do, but under this express caution, that I do not hope nor design at once to represent the life, glory, and beauty of it, or to comprise all things that eminently belong to it. Only I shall set up some way marks that may guide us in our progress or future inquiry into the nature and glory of it. And so I say that sanctification is an immediate work of the Spirit of God on the souls of believers, purifying and cleansing of their natures from the pollution and uncleanness of sin, renewing in them the image of God, and by this enabling them from a spiritual and habitual principle of grace to yield obedience to God according to the tenor and terms of the new covenant by virtue of the life and death of Jesus Christ. Or more briefly, it is a universal renovation of our natures by the Holy Spirit to the image of God through Jesus Christ. So it follows that our holiness, which is the fruit and effect of this work, the work is terminated in us, as it comprises a renewed principle or image of God wrought in us, so it consists in a holy obedience to God by Jesus Christ, according to the terms of the covenant of grace from the principle of a renewed nature. Our apostle expresses a whole more briefly yet, namely, he that is in Christ Jesus is a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 For herein he expresses both the renovation of our natures the endowment of them with a new spiritual principle of life and operation, with actings towards God suitable thereunto. It is, as was before proved, and as by all confessed, the work in us of the Spirit of God. It is a renovation of the Holy Ghost in which we are saved, and a real internal, powerful, physical work it is, as we have proved before abundantly and shall afterward more fully confirm. He does not make us holy only by persuading us so to be. He does not only require us to be holy, propose to us motives to holiness, give us convictions of its necessity, and by this excite us to the pursuit and attainment of it, though this he does also by the word and ministration of it. It is too high an impudency for anyone to pretend an owning of the gospel and yet to deny a work of the Holy Ghost in our sanctification. We have already sufficiently proved that the things promised of God and so effected are really wrought by the exceeding greatness of the power of the Spirit of God, and this will yet afterward be made more particularly to appear. This work of sanctification differs from that of regeneration, as on other accounts, so especially on that of the manner of their being wrought. The work of regeneration is instantaneous, consisting in one single creating act. Hence it is not capable of degrees in any subject. No one is more or less regenerate than another. Everyone in the world is absolutely so or not so, and that equally, although there are degrees in their state on other reasons. But this work of sanctification is progressive and admits of degrees. One may be more sanctified and more holy than another who is yet truly sanctified and truly holy. It is begun at once and carried on gradually. But this observation being of great importance, and such as, if rightly weighed, will contribute much light to the nature of the whole work of sanctification and holiness, I shall divert in this chapter to such an explanation and confirmation of it as may give an understanding and furtherance herein. An increase in growth and sanctification or holiness is frequently in the scripture enjoined us, and frequently promised to us. So speaks the Apostle Peter in a way of command, 2 Peter three seventeen and 18. Fall not, be not cast down from your own steadfastness, but grow or increase in grace. It is not enough that we decay not in our spiritual condition, that we be not diverted and carried off from a steady course in obedience by the power of temptations, but an endeavor after an improvement an increase, a thriving in grace, that is, in holiness, is required of us. And a compliance with this command is that which our apostle so commends in the Thessalonians 2nd Epistle 1, 3, 
namely, the exceeding growth of their faith and abounding of their love, that is, the striving and increase of those graces in them, that which is called increasing with the increase of God, Colossians 2.19, or the increase in holiness which God requires, accepts, approves, by supplies of spiritual strength from Jesus Christ, our head, as it is there expressed. The work of holiness in its beginning is but like seed cast into the earth, namely the seed of God in which we are born again. And it is known how seed that is cast into the earth grows and increases. Being variously cherished and nourished, it is in its nature to take root and to spring up, bringing forth fruit. So is it with the principle of grace and holiness. It is small at first, but being received in good and honest hearts, made so by the Spirit of God, and there nourished and cherished, it takes root and brings forth fruit. And both these, even the first planting and the increase of it, are equally from God by His Spirit. He that begins this good work does also perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, six. And this he does two ways. First, by increasing and strengthening those graces of holiness which we have received and been engaged in the exercise of. There are some graces whose exercise does not depend on any outward occasions, but they are, and that in their actual exercise absolutely necessary to the least degree of the life of God. Such are faith and love. No man does, no man can live to God. But in the exercise of these graces, whatever duties towards God men may perform, if they are not enlivened by faith and love, they belong not to the spiritual life in which we live to God. And these graces are capable of degrees, and so of increase. For so we read expressly of little faith and great faith, weak and strong faith, both true and the same in the substance, but differing in degrees. So also is their fervent love, and that which comparatively is but cold. These graces, therefore, in carrying on the work of sanctification, are gradually increased. So the disciples prayed our Savior that he would increase their faith. Luke 17.5 That is, add to its light, confirm it in its ascent. Multiply its acts and make it strong against its assaults, that it might work more effectually in difficult duties of obedience, which they had in a special regard to, as is evident from the context. For they pray for this increase of faith upon the occasion of our Savior's enjoining frequent forgiveness of offending brethren, a duty not at all easy nor pleasing to flesh and blood. And the Apostle prays for the Ephesians that they may be rooted and grounded in love, that is, that by the increase and strengthening of their love they may be more established in all the duties of it. These graces being the springs and spirit of our holiness, and the increase of them in us, the work of sanctification is carried on, and universal holiness increased. And this is done by the Holy Spirit in several ways. First, by exciting them to frequent actings. Frequency of acts does naturally increase and strengthen the habits once they proceed. And in these spiritual habits of faith and love, it is so, moreover, by God's appointment. They grow and thrive in and by their exercise, Hosea 6, 3. The want of this is a principal means of their decay. And there are two ways in which the Holy Spirit excites the graces of faith and love unto frequent acts. Number one, he does it morally by proposing their objects suitably and seasonably to them. This he does by his ordinances of worship especially the preaching of the word, God in Christ, the promises of the covenant, and other proper objects of our faith and love, being proposed to us, these graces are drawn out to their exercise. And this is one principal advantage we have by attendance on the dispensation of the word in a due manner, namely that by presenting those spiritual truths which are the object of our faith to our minds, and those spiritual good things which are the object of our love to our affections, both these graces are drawn forth in a frequent actual exercise. And we are greatly mistaken if we suppose we have no benefit by the word beyond what we retain in our memories, though we should labor for that also. Our chief advantage lies in the excitation which is thereby given to our faith and love to the proper exercise, and by this are these graces kept alive which without this would decay and wither. In this does the Holy Spirit take the things of Christ and show them to us. 
He represents him to us in the preaching of the word as the proper objects of our faith and love, as he brings to remembrance the things spoken by Christ. That is, in the dispensation of the word, he minds us of the gracious words and truths of Christ, proposing them to our faith and love. And in this lies the secret profiting and thriving of believers under the preaching of the gospel, which it may be they are not sensible of themselves. By this means are many thousands of acts of faith and love drawn forth in which these graces are exercised and strengthened, and consequently holiness is increased, and the word by the actings of faith being mixed with it, as Hebrews 4 2 increases it by its incorporation. Secondly, the Spirit does it really and internally. He dwells in believers, preserving in them the root and principle of all their grace by his own immediate power. Hence all graces in their exercise are called the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, and 23. He brings them forth from the stock that he has planted in the heart. And we cannot act any one grace without his effectual operation therein. God works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13 that is there, is, there is no part of our will singly and separately from him in obedience, but it is the operation of the Spirit of God in us, so far as it is spiritual and holy. He is the immediate author of every good or gracious acting in us, for in us, that is, in our flesh, and of ourselves we are but flesh, there dwells no good thing. Therefore, the Spirit of God dwelling in believers does effectually excite and stir up their graces to frequent exercise and actings in which they are increased and strengthened. And there is nothing in the whole course of our walking before God that we ought to be more careful about than that we don't grieve, that we don't provoke this good and holy spirit in which he should withhold his gracious aids and assistances from us. This, therefore, is the first way in which the work of sanctification is gradually carried on by the Holy Ghost, exciting our graces to frequent actings in which they are increased and strengthened. Secondly, he does it by supplying believers with experiences of the truth and reality, and excellency of the things that are believed. Experience is the food of all grace, which it grows and thrives on. Every taste that faith obtains of divine love and grace, or how gracious the Lord is, adds to its measure and stature. Two things, therefore, must be briefly declared. Number one, that the experience of the reality, excellency, power, and efficacy of the things that are believed is an effectual means of increasing faith and love. Number two, that it is the Holy Ghost which gives us this experience. For the first, God himself expostulates with the church how its faith came to be so weak when it had so great experience of him or of his power and faithfulness. Have you not known? Have you not heard? How then sayest thou that God has forsaken you? And our apostle affirms that the consolations which he had experimentally received from God enabled him to the discharge of his duty towards others in trouble. For herein we prove, or do really approve of, as being satisfied in the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, Romans 12, 2. And this is that which the Apostle prays for in the behalf of the Colossians, in chapter 2, verse 2. I may say that he who knows not how faith is encouraged and strengthened by special experiences of the reality, power, and spiritual efficacy on a soul of things believed, never was made partaker of any of them. How often does David encourage his own faith and that of others from his former experiences, which were pleaded also by our own Lord Jesus Christ, to the same purpose in his great distress? Number two, that it is the Holy Ghost who gives us all our spiritual experiences needs no other consideration to evidence this, but only this, that in them consists all our consolation, his work and office it is to administer consolation to believers as being the only comforter of the church. Now he administers comfort no other way but by giving to the minds and souls of believers a spiritual, sensible experience of the reality and power of the things we believe. He does not comfort us by words but by things. Other means of spiritual consolation I know none, and I am sure this never fails. Give to a soul an experience, a taste of the love and grace of God in Christ Jesus, and be its condition what it will, it cannot refuse to be comforted. And by this does he shed abroad the love of God in our hearts, Romans 5, 5, in which all graces are cherished and increased. Thirdly, he does it by working immediately an actual increase of these graces in us. 
I have showed that these are capable of improvement and of an addition of degrees to them. Now they are originally the immediate work and product of the Spirit in us, as has been abundantly evidenced. And as he first works and creates them, so he increases them. By this, they that are feeble become as David, Zechariah 12.8, that is, those whose graces were weak, whose faith was infirm, and whose love was languid, shall, by the supplies of the Spirit, and the increase given by him to them, become strong and vigorous. To this purpose are promises multiplied in the Scripture, which in our constant supplications we principally respect. This is that which the schoolmen, after Augustine, call the working of the Holy Spirit in the increase and in strengthening of grace received. And this is the principal cause and means of the gradual increase of holiness in us, or the carrying on of the work of sanctification, Psalm 138.8. This has been a reading from the collected works of John Owen on the work of the Holy Spirit in sanctification.